Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the first online seminar from the Public Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Ethics Network. It's delighted to have, we're delighted to have so many people online today. Um, as you'll know from the, from, the, uh, from the poster, from the advertisements, we've got an hour worth of discussion and the focus of our discussion today is going to be, going to be on why should ethics be front and centre to the response to COVID-19 and to what extent is that the case. Um, before we start, before I start introducing our speakers, I'm going to ask uh, Catherine Littler, who's the co-lead of Global Health Ethics and Governance at uh, World Health Organization, to say something about the network. Catherine, over to you. Great. Thanks, uh, Mark. I'd also like to extend my warm welcome to everyone on behalf of the newly established, hard to say, uh, network, Public Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Ethics Network, otherwise known as FEPRIN. Um, this is one, a network that we established in January this year. We've been working on it since post Ebola. We were planning to pilot it over the next six to 12 months, but clearly because of COVID, we've got it up and running now. It's a network or a community. We're aiming to create a global community of bioethicists, which will embed ethics at the heart of decision-making and epidemics going forward both thinking about it in terms of preparedness issues, uh, research and response. We aim to do this over the coming years, uh, first and foremost at the moment by supporting and coordinating real-time contextual ethics advice, by building fair collaborative partnerships across the globe. This is a truly global endeavor. Uh, we want to build local, but also global ethics capacity we want to be a source of knowledge sharing, hence this online seminar and resources for the global research and health communities. Um, and we're going to start doing that by the establishment of the Epidemics Ethics website. So I ask you all to take a look at that at the end and not during this seminar. Um, we have already managed to get over 320 um, resources on COVID and ethics alone. So there's a lot being published. I think we've got a good chunk of it, but I suspect there's a few more out there. And that's anything from statements to webinars um, to guidance. This is, as Mike said, the first in a series of online seminars that we plan to hold. We're going to have them every fortnight. I'm gonna explain the word fortnight because I know people in North America don't use it. Every two weeks. So. That's the aim at the moment. We're also interspersed with other ones. We're looking to do a diversity of topics, everything from fair access to vaccines, to ethics of transitioning out of restrictive measures, to looking at in issues of inequality and how COVID's affecting different populations in different parts of the globe. Um, my final comment is really that the success of this new network is down to the bioethics community. So please do join, please, do get involved. And for those of you who are on that aren't part of the bioethics community, welcome and please let us know what kind of information that you would like from us. And on that note, I'm gonna hand back to Mike. Thanks. So first of all, uh, before we start, just important to let everyone know that this, uh, this seminar is being recorded. Um, and the other, th the other thing I suppose is to say is that we're, our, all each of our speakers are gonna speak for 10 minutes, but we're also interested in knowing you know, putting questions to them. So do send us your questions if you if you think of them um, throughout through through this. Um, um, and this is a really very much a global a global meeting. People from more or less every time zone around the world, and it's great to have you all with us. So before, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first of our speakers, who's going to speak on the topic of why should ethics be front and centre to the response to COVID-19, and that's Professor Ross Upshur from the Dalalana School of Public Health in Toronto. All of my, all of the colleagues on this uh, seminar today are esteemed uh, contributors to global health bioethics. I won't give long introductions because that would take too much time, but uh, delighted to have you all here, Ross. Thank you, Michael. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure and privilege to be the inaugural speaker of this uh, webinar series. And I do hope that uh, you and your loved ones are safe and well in these extraordinary times. So the question is, uh, uh, should ethics be front and center? Uh, I think the question's already been answered because ethics is front and center uh, in this epidemic. In fact, I'm gonna argue that there's kind of a pandemic playbook uh, that uh, whether people appreciate it or not, indicates that our response to epidemics is fundamental 
fundamentally and uh, built upon uh, ethics. So let's, what's, what's the pandemic playbook? And this kind of draws upon 20 years of uh, research since SARS that I've been involved in and actually prior to SARS on ethics and infectious diseases. So if you think of the origins of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, outbreak in Wuhan, what was the first thing that we heard? There's a mysterious new virus. And very shortly thereafter, uh, there was a surge of on the capacity of healthcare institutions in Wuhan, indicating that one of the first issues that arose was, oh, there's a, a, a need to think about resource allocation and how we're going to manage this surge capacity. Secondly, it was a completely unknown uh, virus. So immediately uh, research was uh, uh, contemplated and started very quickly, indicating that research ethics are going to come into play. Thirdly, we saw, unfortunately and tragically, healthcare providers become sick and pass away, raising questions of duty to care and the limits of duty to care. Finally, stringent public health method, uh, measures were put in place, uh, raising questions about the legitimacy uh, uh, and justification of uh, these sorts of measures and bringing public health ethics into play. And finally, when we started to see it spread, we had issues with respect to global governance and global health ethics uh, and you know, issues around public health uh, emergencies of international concern, uh, how we have global collaboration to uh, uh, provide countermeasures. And I would say that uh, you know, this falls in line with how things have gone with other outbreaks. Uh, the difference for this, so if we look at SARS, MERS, uh, the two Ebola outbreaks, Zika, H1N1, Pan flu. So the difference is that this is a true pandemic. It affects all people in the world. And this means that people, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I think everyone now who's been affected has become an ethicist, but, uh, and I've never heard so many people discussing uh, ethical issues. Uh, you know, this isn't right, this isn't fair. Uh, and then, so you've, everybody has their ethical intuitions being uh, twigged. Uh, we also realize that there's some very important issues in, in infectious disease ethics that become surfaced in, in, in a large magnitude. So many people who've worked in infectious disease ethics say one of the distinguishing factors is that you become a victim and a vector simultaneously. And because we all have uh, vulnerability, because there is no uh, pre-existing uh, immunity. So we all have a chance of becoming either infected and by being infected, we become a vector that will give that, uh, transmit that disease uh, on. So the, there's ethical issues at the individual level about the appropriate conduct, about how you behave to your uh, f friends and family, uh, about what your obligations are to your uh, community and to society and what your obligations are uh, more broadly to global communities. So everyone's an ethicist, uh, just like everyone can sing, uh, but not everybody's a, a Pavarotti. So I think the ethics community plays a particularly special role here in helping move the discourse away from sort of blunt assertion of uh, this isn't right, this isn't fair, to starting to give some reasoned giving accounts. Now, most uh, people have resources that they will go to, and in a broad part of the world, uh, many people will turn to their faith traditions for guidance on the appropriate conduct. And we saw from research that we did in SARS that faith communities can actually be great allies for public health. Uh, and we've seen that and witnessed that recently, uh, for example, with the Christian faith during uh, Easter, with the uh, Ju with Judaism during Passover and with, uh, uh, you know, advice that's been uh, offered to the Islamic community for Ramadan, uh, that there is a role in which uh, faith communities can actually provide ethical guidance, I would say, uh, during pandemics. Um, some people will turn to friends and families and trusted elders and community leaders for guidance. And there might actually be some people out there who might turn to ethical theories. So there's, I know that there's many consequentialists out there, virtue theorists, deontologists, rights scholars. And as we've witnessed in the past few weeks, no shortage of libertarians in North America uh, looking for justifications for reasons for doing what they want to do. So when I 
sat this morning before coming in and thought to myself, who would be the ethics guidance that I would turn to? Did I want to bring John Stuart Mill? Did I want to bring Immanuel Kant? But I actually brought the Nicomachean ethics from Aristotle because the Greeks actually understood the critical interdependence of politics and ethics, uh, the importance of civic virtues, uh, the idea of excellences and various other ways of conduct uh, that can actually serve communities. So the important thing to know here is I think it's a learning moment for us all uh, to really emphasize the importance and urgency of ethics because it's not the case that everybody's going to agree on principles on but we can actually set up processes for uh, informed respectful discourse the important thing about pandemics is their complexity they're complex at the ethical level because it goes from the individual through professional through the public health up to global health level but we also as we know need to understand how to think and, and act under uh, conditions of uncertainty and integrate varieties of different science uh, everybody now has also become an armchair epidemiologist understanding models uh, everybody's becoming an armchair immunologist as we think about what it means to have serological tests so on the one side as horrifying as this is, this is a huge opportunity to, for us all to become uh, better educated, to think through the distinction between science and science fiction, and between ethics and reflection as a reasoned giving respectful discourse uh, or blunt assertion of one's preference. And then I'll stop there and let somebody else join in. Thank you for this opportunity. Very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Russ. Uh, it's really so much to so much to think about there, and I've got I've got uh, lots of questions I'd like to ask, but hopefully other people out there will as well. So let's uh, let's just move on now to our next to our next speaker. One of the great things about uh, this online work is you get to see the kind of environments that people live and work in. Uh, so we've just seen Russ's uh, Russ's office there, and now we're about to see uh, Professor Emily Chan's um, environment. So Professor Emily Chan was a colleague of mine on the Nuffield Working Party on the Ethics of Global Health Emergencies recently, and she's Professor and Associate Dean at the Faculty of Medicine at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So Emily, over to you. Hello everyone, I'm glad to have the chance to share with you some stories and perspective from our side of the world. Um, I'm in Hong Kong right now in China. And I think um, together with um, the team, I mean, this uh, discussion, I think it's very clear that uh, there are many issues surrounding ethics um, around global health emergencies. And as Ross highly points out, there are the theoretical side of the discussion. But I just want to point out a few important things which is happening in the front line or in places where uh, research may be needed, but actions are needed. I think one of the challenge with global health emergencies is that I mean, there's of no doubt that uh, with a new uh, condition like COVID-19, um, there would need science. But the problem is uh, how research is being done could be problematic and could be filled with uh, multiple challenges. People argue that um, there are um, challenges in emergencies for ethical principles. But I will, I will argue that it's not the principle that is being challenged, it's the process how research should be done. Because I mean, emergencies, time, it's uh, very crucial. And I mean, the research findings or decision made um, to support the community uh, would mean life and death. And I mean, there are a few questions I want to put it in this seminar for, I guess, discussion or even future discussion for um, colleagues to consider. The one is the whole concept of the power and influence again. Because one of the key problem with um, our decision made during an emergency for a community or a pandemic for the global community is whose voice is being heard. Uh, we would assume that the research, the action that was being done is actually for the sake of the patients or the affected population. But if we actually look carefully at the research being invested, they're looking, of course, at the virus, uh, looking at the genome sequence and all those good things. But the problem is, I mean, how are those results being applied to the field, applied to the user is an issue. And the challenge is who is representing the patients. There are many ongoing um, efforts um, of treatment, of social policies, of isolation, of quarantine, but there's rarely of their voice being heard, okay? Whether the policies are affecting the community, how about the ethics of placing an underage um, 
patient in isolation without their parents. Okay, those are some examples of what's going on, I guess, in many parts of the world. The second important um, I, um, highlight I want to point out is that I am in support of science, no doubt. But there's also the issue whether the current, in the name of science, people were doing a lot of research, but whether the research study design is relevant for the appropriate findings. Because, I mean, um, of course, a lot of global comparisons are being done by online, but whether the online mechanism, for example, as research design may be able to reach the audience or the participants or the stakeholders is another issue. Like in Asia, there are many research already highlight that that the vulnerable groups are the ones who are not going online. They may watch TV, they may listen to radio, but they still may not be as online as they should be. And if you want to understand what's happened to them, perhaps we can extrapolate. You should actually outreach to them. But whether our research now being done is, may, is managing to assess them is another very important point to, to think about. The third important item, which is not only for COVID-19, it's for other global health emergencies, is the idea of um, a meaningful consent. Again, for research or for work or policies, it's important to understand it's good to study them, but whether the consent was given or whether there's an opt-out process for people to make a choice, at least the respect of that opt-out process is very much a gap uh, right now going on in the world. And of course, the other important thing is who are the duty bearers? We can naturally assume that it may be the researchers, the policy makers, but perhaps donor has a role because many of the times it's the donor because people are concerned with the major future don donation and how they will actually listen to. But many of the times, even for do donor with all the good intentions, after they donate the resources to, for, for research or for whatever programs, they may not take the responsibility of follow up to see whether that money was used the right way. And as a result, I mean, the intended research may not um, translate to the right way or to translate to the um, agreed or, I mean, or um, intended community. And last but not least, it's also important to think about, I mean, all the information that was collected for the current COVID-19. Um, again, um, pandemic, I hope it's not going to happen many, for many times. We already have a hard, uh, long battle in Ebola for Africa. And I mean, this time is an opportunity to learn from this global situation. But how much of the current data or in the name of policy making is going to synthesize to meaningful future? Um, the frustration, I mean, because I was also working uh, alongside with my colleagues in the social science community, even I'm a clinician, is that we are trying to look for the evidence to support decision making in policies. But the challenge is that when we go into the literature, even though a lot of researchers were trying to, in the name of research, um, collect a lot of data from previous um, research, but only a few was managed to translate further to support um, the community response. And what are these, uh, what may be a good framework that we may use or develop because of this COVID-19 for future um, epidemic or pandemic is actually very worthwhile to think about. It's ethics. It's definitely responsibility for our generation of researchers or people interested for responsible policy making to ensure what is now going on. At least we can minimally synthesize the right response or the right policy or program for the future pandemic. So I just want to pose a few questions and um, Mike, back to you. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much, Emily. And that, that last theme particularly about how we can make sure that we learn for the future and we're better prepared next time there's, a, there's an epidemic or a pandemic is, is, is a theme that resonates with the, with the people who are asking questions and it came up in Ross's talk earlier. You know, one of the things that's uh, striking about this current epidemic is how little we learned from previous from previous experiences, and we don't want to. We don't want the same things happen again. So then we'll certainly come back to that question at the at the end. Thanks very much, Emily. So uh, yeah. So now I'll I'll hand over to our third speaker. I don't. Uh, are you unmuted? Yeah, it looks like you are, uh, Jerome. So this is uh, Professor Jerome Singh, who's head of ethics and law at the Centre for AIDS Program of Research in South Africa, Capriza. So over to you, uh, Jerome. Thanks so much. And thanks for Catherine to, uh, for introducing us and for actually bringing the seminar together. I thought what I wanted to do is to maybe emphasize or raise issues from a particularly interesting perspective, an important perspective, and that's the low and middle income country perspective. And I think that 
in in a setting with, that I'm living in, for example, which is South Africa, which is often described as having one foot in the developed world and one foot in the developing world, we're beginning to see very, very uh, heartfelt situations right now with our lockdown. And I think this is reflected throughout Africa. So I think maybe to start off, it's important to maybe emphasize that usually Africa is one of the first continents to get hit by major pandemics, especially Ebola being one of the major ones that's been recent. But this time around, Africa has been relatively unscathed and has been hit last. But what figures are showing is in the last week or so, the number of cases has been rising quite rapidly. And you know, new projections are showing that over 300,000 people at minimum could die. And I think what we just need to remember is that for the cases in Africa, while the figures seem to be quite low, it's actually masking what the real situation on the ground is. The lack of testing and surveillance in most countries because of a lack of testing kits and of course surveillance infrastructure is really hampering our, our figures in terms of knowing how bad the epidemic is spreading throughout Africa. So I think it's important just to note that while Africa does seem to have low figures, uh, experts are in fact saying that the numbers are considerably higher. But I think having said that, what I wanted to just maybe speak about is, and for me, what I want to focus on in particular, not so much the research issues or some of the issues that involve uh, philosophical underpinnings, but I wanted to maybe focus on one principle in particular, and that's the principle of reciprocity. I think the important thing in the African context is that many African countries have instituted lockdowns or curfews. And that's had a devastating impact on African countries and especially in poorer communities in those settings. Uh, at this point in time, most of Africa work on uh, part of the informal economy. They, most people don't have formal jobs. You may find people are hawkers, they're informal traders. And with the lockdown, you're finding lots and lots of people are confined to their homes. They are unable to actually earn an income. And because most of Africa is quite poor, you'll find countries haven't actually put in place any sort of support system to assist very poor and vulnerable communities. So what we have happening throughout Africa, including in parts of South Africa as well, is literally tens of thousands of people un unable to earn an income and beginning to literally face starvation. And I think this is actually a very, very tragic situation that's not making too much of headline news, mainly because, you know, right now, of course, most of the news media is focused on the epidemic in North America, especially the US, and of course, in Europe, and in particular, what's happening in Italy, Spain, and the UK and France. But I think, you know, a con continent like Africa, and maybe many other low and middle income settings elsewhere in the world, like in Asia, a lot of the issues that are happening on the ground right now is millions of people facing poverty, and uh, poverty being made worse by lockdown measures or containment measures. So I think when a state actually puts in place measures in the interest of public health, it has to take into account how this impact, how this will impact on poorer people in those settings. So I think, you know, important to also mention as well from a developing world context is that millions of people in low and middle income countries also live in very dense settlements. Typically you'll find there are tens of millions of people throughout regions that actually live in shanty towns or alternatively other forms of uh, habitats, for example, like rural uh, homesteads, where there's quite dense living and quite dense uh, homestead uh, numbers. And I think probably what that raises is that if we're talking about asking people to sanitize and asking people to wash their hands, we have to ask ourselves first of all and keep to keep social distancing. The important questions we ask ourselves is how does that play out in a developing world setting when you have maybe up to eight to 10 people living in a one bedroom dwelling? or in a very small space uh, that may not be one bedroom, but at least two bedrooms. And you'll find that in that type of setting, it's virtually impossible to keep a distance of one to two meters. You think about the migrant camps in Syria, other places around the world where you have huge refugee populations and trying to keep social distancing is close to no the possibility of doing that. I think we also need to remember that in many places around the world, especially in uh, informal settlements, you'll find that typically people don't have access to water. There may be one communal tap that's quite far away. And you'll typically find that if there are uh, any sort of ablution facilities, these are communal in nature. And very often you'll find that there may be, where in those countries that even have those facilities, there may be a portable toilet, but you'll find that there'll be no facilities to wash your hands. So I think, you know, the important issues is that when we're looking at confronting or dealing with COVID-19 globally, 
the emphasis of club public health and what authorities have been emphasizing is wash your hands often, keep a social distance, and of course, uh, stay in your homes. But I think we need to remember that those types of rules and those types of constraints pose a pro provide very, very challenging um, situations for African countries and other low and middle income countries in Asia and Latin America. So I think when we're looking at how do we actually enforce these types of measures and what are we doing about that, we can't talk about or expect people to follow these measures of social distancing, washing their hands or as, as often as they can when most people in those settings actually don't have access to water, don't have access to sanitation, and in fact are living in quite dense settings. So it brings me back to the principle that I spoke about, which is if we're expecting people, and I'm talking about the vast majority of people in Africa and in Latin America and, and in Asia who live in more low and middle income countries, you have to take into account what is the state or what are other global health actors like the WHO or even UNICEF and other players what are they doing to actually ameliorate the plight of the poor and the vulnerable in those settings? Are you providing food packs? Are you providing sanitation? Are you providing water? And if so, how is this being done? Up communities that are expected to stay in their homes and not earn a living, how are, they, how are they being helped? And how is the state and how are other agencies helping them? So I think for me, from an ethics perspective, when you're looking at responding to COVID-19, that for me is the central thing, is that if you're expecting people to stay in their homes and to make a sacrifice for the greater good, we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing for them? For them to actually make the sacrifice for global public health or local public health, the state and other players should be doing something to reciprocate their sacrifice. We don't wanna have people be saved from COVID-19 only to starve. So I think for me, those are the important factors that I wanted to raise from a developing world perspective. Thank you. Great, thanks, thank you very much. Jerome, and thanks very much to all of our speakers. We've got, uh, I've got a long, a long, it's great to see the chat here. I've got a long list of questions, so I'll try my best to, to manage those. But, uh, but I think the plan is to keep the questions afterwards, so hopefully we can do some more work around those if people uh, have the opportunity to, to give some answers. But um, I suppose one of the things that uh, is, is apparent in the current outbreak from an ethics point of view is the speed with which uh, research plans or so developments around vaccines, for example, the, the, the speed and the pressure to do these things very quickly. And on, so on the one hand, there's a question of speed um, to do things we're kind of familiar with, developing vaccines. And on the other hand, there are a number of novel research methodologies or novel, novel in this kind of context, for example, the use of challenge studies. Um, and one of the questions is, given this background of speed and also innovation, to what extent do you think that ethics, research ethics, is, has, has the ability to keep up and can make a useful contribution. So I, if any of you would like to, we could go around, but I don't know who wants to respond to that first. Russ, maybe? Thanks, Michael. Yeah. I, I think the ethics uh, community is prepared. So we went through a lot of this uh, during Ebola. So if you think of Ebola as a kind of archetypal experience of a serious pandemic with high mortality in a low and middle income setting. Uh, in 2014, when the public health emergency of international concern was declared, there was kind of therapeutic nihilism and almost, uh, you know, pessimism. There were no vaccines, no drugs. WHO convened a group to say, uh, should we fast track uh, research uh, into unregistered and um, you know, agents, we said yes. And five years later, we have a registered vaccine and two monoclonal antibodies that have shown that have basically reversed the mortality. Through that time, we had several meetings where we talked about methodology because there were controversies about placebo controlled trials, about different uh, uh, randomized control trial uh, methodologies, about, uh, you know, whether you can even have uh, uh, adaptive trials. So I think the architecture of study design uh, has changed quite quickly, and I think the ethics community has kept pace. I think that, you know, the Global Forum for uh, Bioethics and Research had a whole session on uh, novel, adapt uh, novel trial designs in uh, global health research. That being said, I think there is still a global lack of capacity and we really need to uh, build capacity in research ethics uh, oversight uh, globally so that these kinds of uh, challenging new uh, designs can be uh, understood, uh, their strengths and weaknesses, they can get appropriate ethics oversight. 
And I know also there's an independent process that's looking very carefully at human challenge studies. So I've actually been quite proud of the ethics community. To be honest, when we showed up at the R&D Blueprint meeting in Geneva with the ethics working group, um, our house was more in order than other uh, groups, so to speak, uh, because of all of the work that we had done basically from SARS through uh, pandemic preparedness through Ebola. Um, is it perfect? No. Uh, but at least there's guidance there. Uh, I still have some questions about how much we've learned, but I think actually the ethics infrastructure is there to actually safely and expertly evaluate. I mean, in the conceptual side, it's on the ground building capacity that work, the work needs to be done. Anyone else want to contribute to that? Or oh, shall I move on to the next question? No? Okay. Um, Jerome, maybe this is one for you to think about, but hopefully everyone has a view. Several of the comments uh, that we that I've got in front of me relate to the fact that this is a global problem, which is only really going to be solved through yeah, if it can be seen as a as a as a global problem requiring shared shared action, a collective action problem. But what we're actually seeing in practice is countries looking after themselves, and very national level, or perhaps even to some extent regional level, but certainly national level uh, focus on these things. So that raises a number of questions. One question is. You know, can anything be done to help countries to work together? But more explicitly, as an ethical question, to do and to what extent, if they do, high-income countries have obligations to uh, low-income settings, for example, the kinds of settings you described, um, Jerome, in yours. Do you want to say something about that, about what you think the obligations of high-income countries are at the moment? Sure. I'll maybe uh, say something about that and also comment on what are some of the practical issues that I think high-income countries can assist with. I think, you know, right now, most of the high income countries are very preoccupied with their own domestic pandemic issues and understandably so. But I think, you know, what is happening is that a lot of African countries are facing dire shortages of personal protective equipment, ventilators. So just to give you some idea, and for those of you who may not be aware, you'll find that, you know, it's estimated that at least 10 African countries don't even have a single ventilator. Others have less than five for the entire country. And you'll find that when those countries are not trying to procure those equipment, it's virtually impossible to get them because of course you've got the affluent countries also looking for ventilators as well. And at the end of the day, you'll find that when it comes to the totem pole, African countries and poor countries in Latin America and in Asia, at the bottom of the totem pole, they simply cannot compete. They don't have the firepower to compete with the mass purchases of the US or mass purchases of Europe. And when you're finding countries like the US outbidding and basically almost in a sense hijacking supplies going for countries like Germany, you can imagine that if Germany is getting shortchanged by the US, African countries stand very little chance about you know, in terms of getting these things. So I think in terms of where supplies could go and what uh, in the developed countries, affluent countries could do is it would be great if capacity could be ramped up, not just for domestic production, but if a small percentage could in fact be reserved for poor uh, settings in low and middle income countries, and in particular, the least developed countries of the world, which actually have very, very little resource. And you know, my advice is that regional bodies, like for example, the African Union, should be actually thinking about pooling the resources and bulk purchasing, not just allowing countries to bid on an, indiv on an individual basis. And you'll find that in countries that have split healthcare systems. So in a country like South Africa, we have a private healthcare system and a state care healthcare system there's a lack in a sense almost of coordination where you find private health uh, care providers are bidding against the state for the same equipment. So you're gonna need some sort of regional coordination to ensure that there's mass bulk purchases and where you find major regional countries like South Africa should be stepping in to procure equipment for countries that are immediately surrounding the country. And similarly, regional uh, powers like Kenya and Ethiopia should be doing that for East Africa. You'll find that uh, Egypt and Algeria should be doing that for North Africa, Morocco for uh, you know, the Northwest Africa, and of course, Nigeria maybe for West Africa. So I think that's the only way, and that can only be done through partnerships with affluent countries. You know, right now you'll find that the private premier, the private sector and individual donors in countries, billionaires basically in, in low and middle income countries, along with billionaires in countries like China, are actually taking the lead in making sure that important supplies get sent to African countries. And I think that's actually quite remarkable, but I do think that there is a role beyond just the private community and private 
procurement, but for states to order regionally. And we do appreciate the efforts of many countries. For example, China has been giving lots of supplies to African countries. The US government has been increasing and ramping up its, its aid and foreign aid. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, it is quite a, a tough market right now. It is the equivalent of a, you know, a market where everybody's bidding for the same thing. And you'll find that in the, in the global marketplace of bidding, low and middle income countries, especially the least developed countries of the world, are virtually powerless to bid against the big countries. So I would strongly, on ethics grounds, urge affluent countries and role players in those countries to actually consider Africa that they're about a month to six weeks behind Europe in terms of the epidemic spreading. So it's given Africa a little bit of a chance to start preparing, but the bottom line is that it's nowhere near where, we are not nowhere near increasing the surveillance numbers to the numbers that we need because of a shortage of reagents and testing kits. We're nowhere near preparing our critical care services because of a shortage of ICU beds and ventilators, but we're no closer to achieving those goals or to ramping things up because simply speaking, there's just, we can't bid against the rich countries. Yeah. Yeah. And to some extent, these situations provide a particularly intense environment where, where existing global inequalities are just made much more visible and much more problematic. Yeah. Yes. Um, and yeah, anyone else want to contribute to that one? Emily. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, I just want to also follow up on what Jerome has said. I'm very glad he bring out uh, the issue of informal settlement. It's um, aside from in Africa, in low and middle income country, even in communities where it's branded as high income, um, informal settlement will still be a problem. If you go to a high, uh, densely populated um, vertical city like Hong Kong, um, the whole discussion about isolation, um, it looks good on paper, but it's difficult to maintain that distance in some of the communities, for sure, because, I mean, there's a lot of um, social like implications on the recommendation and whether it's realistic and practical. And second of all, I think, I mean, um, Mike has also highlighted an important issue that, um, yes, most research right now is highlighting on vaccines and treatment, which is essential, and also as uh, workers' protection, but it still takes some time. But in terms of sharing, of findings. I do think the social science uh, research is still, I mean, a major gap because, I mean, a lot of researchers are aware of the implications, but uh, resources are not distributed for the social science community. For instance, we know that there are a lot of secondary impact associated with policies made, I mean, because of the COVID-19. For instance, the secondary impact of like home isolation. I um, mean, like, I mean, in the, in the home care studies that we are working together with the WHO colleagues, I mean, with the COVID-19 roadmap, and also with the latest finding, at least in Hong Kong, we know that, I mean, for statistics, 55% of the community, because they, they are in home care, are reporting major stress and difficulty because they do not know what to do if they are home caring their patients, okay? So there are major issues with not only the vaccine and the treatment, we, if we want to have evidence, I mean, how do we synthesize the right evidence to support decision makings of real people, of individuals who are taking care of their health? It's not just a scientist, but there's simply a lack of translation of all the research or whatever is found. So I would argue that aside from all the biological science research, social science is right now at this moment, perhaps the probably the important tool to support communities like in low-income communities for them to make some decisions for themselves. But that is a gap. And actually, there's very limited being talked about. And I hope that um, we will be able to do more with Catherine's support, I mean, with um, the social science discussion in the future for ethics. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, while you were uh, given your on, online, uh, Emily, one, there was a question you mentioned in your presentation about the difficulties of engaging with people who are not digitally connected. Um, but we've, in our work, and, and uh, more or less anyone who writes about these issues to do with particularly to do with research in these situations, emphasizes the importance of community engagement, of involving communities, and in particularly involving the most vulnerable. So you, you highlighted a problem, which is digital, uh, lack of digital connection. Do you have any, uh, so a couple of people have asked, have you got any thoughts about how that might be addressed? How you might, how you might deal with that? Well, I think um, the digital platform does allow uh, some amazing opportunity to share information. But I think that actually leads back to two important, um, important issues. One is uh, how do you do risk communications for a mosaic diverse community? 
So there's of no doubt that uh, we should maximize the impact of digital use, but that also leads to the problem with all the misinformation, disinformation that is around. What should we do about that? Um, that is one level about the digital platform. But all those who are left behind without uh, the access, sometimes it's access, sometimes it's really the refusal of use of digital, I mean, communication, those people are vulnerable. So I would argue that policy mechanisms, programs, and people are interested in those communities should still remain sensitive when they develop their program to outreach those, those communities, at least from the studies we find in Hong Kong for H7, H7N9, I mean, other major like um, um, infectious diseases that are going on in urban communities. Um, older people, people who are in certain occupations, like the cab driver, will listen to radio more than online because of their, their way of, I mean, choice of channel of communication. So we argue that programs should remain sensitive to the channel of their choice and tailor the message across and make sure that the information that was shared was also accurate because misinformation is a major problem with the current COVID-19. So more to it, but Right, so much for you. the answer. Thank you, Mike. Right, thank you. So now I've got a couple of questions that in a way would be quite good to get everyone's response to. Um, the first one is about, so in, in several countries now, we're starting to see talk about uh, emerging from the lockdown, emerging from the restrictions on movement and on, on social gatherings of various kinds and people, the idea of people being, for example, children being allowed back to school. And clearly that's in different places, that's going at a different speed. And we've had a couple of questions about to what extent do you think, well, what do you think are the important ethical questions in those kinds of decisions about, about when and how to emerge from the restrictive measures that many, I mean, 4.5 billion people are currently living under lockdown. So these are really important new decisions. So any, so uh, does anyone, perhaps be good if you hear your views about whether that, that presents new ethical issues. So Ross, maybe you go first. Let's go in the order that we, we, we spoke. Yeah, about. so this is something that uh, I've been thinking quite a lot about and also with uh, colleagues trying to get our, wrap our heads around this one because it's a rather uh, difficult and complex issue because it's sim simply not the case of reversing uh, what was put in place. Uh, it's also a, a, a situation which I think requires not just ethics, but uh, uh, political theory, and po because it's going to be a lot of political decision making as well, and what's going to inform them. The role I think ethics can play here is as a buffer. I think somebody mentioned uh, this uh, emergence of uh, you know economic interests dominating mm -hmm. and predominating the discourse. So one, historically, we can remember that uh, economics is merely ethics that's become mathematical in many ways. Uh, you know the uh, and and that there it actually contains within it core normative assumptions about people and their behavior. Uh, so I think uh, the other thing we want to do is make sure that it doesn't become a polarized discussion between the economy and public health. I think that would be a, a huge mistake. Um, I think we need to expand our discourse in ethics uh, to start to think about uh, uh, various different ways in which we can elaborate principles uh, drawing from uh, public health ethics, uh, where we start to think about how we can manage situations where broadly competing interests need to be mediated and have some sort of uh, uh, place and process uh, where we can actually discuss this. So I've been having a lot of discussions with my public health colleagues. And so depending on where you live in the world, pretty much everybody has a public health uh, that's a government or related to the government that has the legislated mandate for health protection. And many of these uh, restrictive measures were put in place under either public health legislation or uh, emergency legislation that has public health uh, dimensions to it. Um, public health is the only group that has health protection mandates. However, there's a tension within public health because most public health people, we've talked about equity, social determinants, disparities, uh, public health and population health has understood that economic disadvantage and driving and making the worst off even worse off actually has very significant and enduring long-term health uh, effects. So wrapping our heads around this tension within public health, concern for health protection and concern for the economic and social well-being of uh, populations and communities is gonna require a certain amount of nimble, agile decision-making under uncertainty. 
However, I would say we've learned enough about how this virus behaves in, in populations. My clinical and clinical research work is in aging and frailty. Uh, we know that COVID preys differentially upon uh, uh, you know, vulnerable older adults. So we're gonna have to think about buffers. We're gonna have to about thinking about rings of protection. We're gonna have to think about uh, ways we can keep uh, people protected and allow people to uh, uh, become active again. But most importantly, I think there's a strong public health warrant for having very, very uh, uh, devoted investment into surveillance, testing, and surveillance itself is problematic depending on where you live, and we can maybe have a whole session on that. So I don't have any clear and convincing arguments of a particular way that it should go, but I do think uh, ethics can serve as a very, very important buffer uh, for uh, economic interests that are going to be uh, active, loud, and pushing to be uh, first out of the gate and probably leave a lot of people who've been worsenly, uh, worse, worsened in their condition during the pandemic behind. Right, thank you. Uh, Emily, do you have anything to say on that? And then I'll come right, to I have two quick uh, <clears throat> quick points. One, it's about the idea of isolation because, I mean, um, in many communities, I'm not saying all, but in, in around the world, um, once people are isolated, I mean, where they live would be disclosed and it becomes a privacy and confidentiality issue. I mean, in the law or in the regulations, it may not be very clear because it was in the grasp of public health. But I mean, even for research that we have done, we actually found that more than 70% of people actually reported if they found their neighbor to be a suspected case or themselves, they are so concerned with stigmatism. Okay, I guess, I mean, again, in a, in a ground, I mean, for the purpose of public health protection, there are issues, but I wonder whether policymakers has evaluated the implications on the social fabric of the society of how they are going to work on this. So it's not like they should not, or they should, but they, at least the consideration of how that plays in privacy and confidentiality should be there. Um, the second point I want to bring is also related to frontline practice. Um, it's about the ethics dimension. I mean, there are, we know in clinical that but, I mean, there are people who require service to sustain life. People on dialysis, people on oncology care, people on a number of care services that is required to survive. But then again, in many communities, uh, because of COVID-19 resources are really deployed for good reasons too. But whether the service providers or policymakers has considered special consideration for those care needs, and actually that backs to a more fundamental question for service that are supporting life-sustaining medical service. I mean, whether they have a consider in emergencies like a pandemic, what are their approach? And I would argue if they already are providing people who require that for survival are not thinking about that as an ethical issue. So this time, again, offers an opportunity for people to reflect, okay, what may be their service providing mandate. Thank you, Mike. Right, thank you. Uh, Jerome, do you have any thoughts on this? So this is about, I mean, you, you were talking about Africa in a way being a bit, um, bit later to this problem, but many countries are talking about emerging and the problems there. Do you have any thoughts on that at this stage or is it uh, too early for that? I think, you know, just a little minor thoughts that I'll just touch on. i touch on maybe some of the issues that I thought were of relevance also to Africa that the previous speakers noted. And that is, I think, you know, what has caused some concern in some African settings is tracing and how tracing is taking place. And as we know, there's been an attempt to use cell phone technology and to use tracking by cell phone. And I think in, we just need to remember that concerns about privacy and concerns about human rights issues are different in different settings. And you'll find that while in many, many countries, not just in Africa, but around the world, but in many African countries, there's not a true reflection of human rights. And so you'll find that the one concern has been that you may find that certain technologies may be exploited to target certain people for political reasons or for persecution for uh, a whole range of different reasons. And I think those are very valuable concerns that need to be highlighted. I think that unlike Europe and North America and even some Asian countries and Latin American countries where you find strong human rights frameworks that can actually keep governments in check, you'll find in Africa, there are very weak court systems in many countries. There's no respect for the rule of law in other settings. And you'll find that very often officials act with impunity so I think we need to be very, very careful about how technology is utilized and that it doesn't actually open the floodgates for 
other types of mission creeps where you find that a purportedly technology is going to be used for COVID-19, but in fact, it's being used to track down political opponents or to track down other people who may be marginalized people in the country as well. So I do think those are some of the issues that I just thought I would mention in the context of some of the concerns raised or comments raised by other people. So I do think that, you know, while Africa doesn't actually have, you know, while Africa may not have too many ventilators between all the countries, and while Africa may not have too many testing kits, kits and reagents, we certainly do have a lot of cell phones. Cell phone penetration rates in Africa are high. They exceed, you know, landline, uh, fixed telephone lines uh, rates. And so you'll find that it's a relatively easy way to keep track of people. So we just need to make sure that our watchdogs and civil society organizations are quite, um, I should say, they, they're quite observant about what governments and and how authorities actually use information. I think the other major challenge is that we're speaking about ethics, but I think there's also an important role for law to play. But the challenge here is that many countries don't have strong privacy mechanisms and they don't have strong human rights mechanisms. And human rights, I always tell people, is the starting point. It prescribes minimum norms. It's not the savior of society. What you really need is ethics because in many countries, human rights frameworks don't provide for a right to health they don't provide for a right to privacy explicitly. That doesn't mean now that just because it's not a human right, that those values are not important values. So that's why I always believe that ethics is a higher standard than human rights, and that we can't rely on human rights to protect people. We need aspirational principles, and we need principles to actually push governments to act morally and socially and ethically and culturally you know, right, in, especially in the, in the context of a pandemic. Thank you very much. So that this time has gone so quickly. We now have six minutes left. Uh, uh, I, I'm hoping that when the when the recording is shared, that the chat line will be shared as well, because there are so many interesting issues on there. But I, I want to ask our speakers one one kind of final question, which is, it, I think it, you know, this one of the key things for me about this current pandemic is. How, let, how little we appear to have learned. I mean, we, as Ross said earlier on, there, there have been, there's a lot of thinking has been done about the ethics of, of, uh, of, of epidemics, uh, infectious disease historically, but we've had to somehow learn those lessons over again, and we have those lessons have to be disseminated every time. So I guess the, que the question I want to ask has two parts. What is it that we could have done better this time to learn from previous experience, and what can we do now to make sure that next time this happens if it happens again that we're better prepared so uh maybe i'll go with you ross because you've got lots yeah of so um only got five minutes we've bar barely scratched the surface on the topics uh there's so many lessons to learn another one is about zoonoses and environmental health so i'm just going to quote from a blog that we published uh after ebola there's a reason i have no hair I've pulled it out uh, because of my frustration of dealing with these issues. So the most important we must learn from this Ebola outbreak, this was the Guinea 2014, uh, is our inability to learn lessons from past outbreaks. We, either, we have hit the snooze button repeatedly and learn the lessons all over again when the next outbreak emerges. We either have collective amnesia or collective narcolepsy. There is a trope throughout, and I've documented them all, and we wrote a paper on this about SARS, wake up call, we've got to learn lessons. H1N1, wake up call, we've got to learn lessons. Ebola, wake up call, we've got to learn lessons. We've learned nothing. So now is an opportunity, because this is a true pandemic, to see if we as a species can actually learn. And I'm in pursuit of the smallest unit of collective human memory because my sense is that two months out of this, we'll be back to thinking uh, about uh, where we're gonna go for dinner or something. <laughs> Sorry, a little dark, but. Uh... <laughs> That's dark. Um, hopefully this network can contribute something towards that in future seminars, but let's, we've got just got a couple of minutes left. So Emily and Jerome, Emily, do you wanna say anything about this? Sure, Mike, I think just a quick point, uh, aside from, I totally agree with Ross, I mean, it's, well, how do you synthesize the lessons learned? But it's about people. Hmm. All the research, all the policy making, all the discussions about people, I think, uh, if this time, at least it's global, so I assume that people would at least will have a chance to feel it. I mean, unfortunately, when Ebola and a lot of those infectious diseases were happening, it's only for a regional um, I mean, audience. I hate to put it that way, but this time it's global. If we do not take this chance to share and to be able to work something and go forward, it's an opportunity missed. So I just want to highlight it's the people that we should always think about. Yeah. Thanks. And Jerome, quickly, something from you? Yes, I, I think probably for me, one of the market issues in this pandemic has been 
how quickly governments reacted. And first and foremost was actually trying to protect the economy, which is very important. But in protecting the economy, the focus has been on corporates and the focus has been on middle income people and in trying to ensure that some sort of mechanisms are put in place to protect them. I think the biggest lesson here that I would say countries need to be thinking about is what mechanisms are you putting in place for the poorest people who are not part of the formal network, who don't have tax numbers, who don't actually have unemployment schemes that they can tap into, or who cannot form part of formal business uh, networks and applying for relief. So I think for me, those people who are in the rural areas, uh, peri-urban areas, informal settlements, and who are part of a very informal co economy that are not even captured anywhere, I'm not sure how you prevent those people from starving. So I think for me, this pandemic has been very different from Ebola, has been very different from any of the other ones because of the nature of the lockdowns that we've had, where you've had now more than 4 billion people or so in lockdowns, but very little thought has been given in terms of how to prevent those people from starving to death and how to actually ensure that you get water and sanitation to them when this disease depends on sanitation for its stoppage. So I think I will just end there and say that our challenge is to think about pandemics and think about how do we protect the poorest people, not the middle income people or the high income people and corporates. Right. Yeah. Thank you. That's a, that's a happy point to end on and it raises all sorts of questions about who's responsible for that and clearly those there are, there are responsibilities at national and international levels that we would need to talk about if we had time. Thanks very much for all our speakers. Thank you, Catherine, for organising this. Do you want to say anything finally to about the network or about what's what's happening next? I don't. I don't think you're on mute. No, no, no. The only thing, and we're about to finish in thirty seconds, is we. Yeah. This is, as I said, the first. We will take the questions. We'll put it up on the website, and we will have more in this session. So please let us know what other topics you would like to have and what you would like this network to focus on going forward. But thank you all for your participation. And thank you, Mike, for chairing and to our speakers.